We have Augustine who believed in, um, he didn't believe in the literal <laughs> interpretation of Genesis of the Genesis account. So he like turned everything that was in the creation story into an allegory and was like, nah, that wasn't literally what it was like. And he taught it like more from a poetical stance. Right. Like, what do we do with guys like that? Or guys from the 18, 17, what, 15, 16, 17, 18 hundreds <laughs> and even 19 hundreds that were mad racist. They owned slaves. They they said that black people were inferior um, they said that like there should be no in, in the 1900s specifically there should be no interracial marrying either right. like you know you and can't, that was preached in pulpits yo too. that's yeah. what I'm saying like it was sure. preached and it was lived out what do we right. do with guys that just they lived in a way or they preached in a way that we would disagree with today that that isn't well biblical. I think we do with them just like we do with the characters in scripture you know David is my one of my favorite characters that I see in the Bible but David was an adulterer and a murderer Mm -hmm. You know, and then Psalm 51 has been a bomb for me. So I can't throw away Psalm 51 just because David was an adulterer and a murderer. Right. You know, so I think we should extend as much understanding as possible and know that men are inherently sinful even and struggle with sin even after conversion, you know, right. but. Now, I'm not, again, you know, I think scripture, of course, scripture is the inspired word of God. And that's ultimately why we have to read it. Yeah. And, and whatever. I'm just saying that even through its inspired scripture, God used men who committed acts that were egregious and evil. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, like, use that as a filter, I guess. Yeah. Because I, one of my heroes, John Calvin, of course, was Augustinian all the way. <laughs> yeah. You know? And yeah. yeah, and but it's funny because some of these guys like Augustine like <laughs> preach things that today we would condemn people if they preached it today. And like my my follow up question to that question would be, why does it seem like we are quick to condemn teachers today that preach false things, mm. um, and show so much mercy to the guys in the background, like That's from true. from history? That's a problem. Like T D Jakes, yeah, or like. Joel Osteen or anything like I'm not saying yeah. they're on the same level as the church right. fathers, early right. church fathers. Right. But why are we so quick to condemn H guys what, today right. for preaching falsely H and not <clears throat> condemn the guys from the past? I think it's because the lack of resources like, you know, um, to, to have the, the extended resources we have today, the denial factor or the denial uh how you call it uh, denying things now is, is a lot more easier than it was back then you didn't have Augustine didn't have all the resources we have today so you think the resources is the X factor they didn't have the the broadened views that we have today the resources we have today the books we have today the even the history we have today you know what I'm saying uh, though there were wars being fought in the first five centuries of the Christian church that needed to be fought, you know, once they were fought, then it gave you the chance to pick a side. Yeah. Cause I was going to say even the, what the crusades and all that, that happened later after. Yeah. That, that was like a 1000. Yeah. Like see or so yeah. uh, afterwards, but like some I guess, people thank God for the crusades <laughs> as Christians. Uh, like I don't know Christianity wouldn't have been able to spread worldwide the way it did. And it became mainstream again nah, in the world. That's like, ignorance. They don't understand the crusades, you know, but they were like, oh, well, they were just defending the turf. <laughs> no, no, that's not what they did. <laughs> but yeah. So I, I think that um, I think the problem with like a Jake's, for instance, is that he has the history. He has a points of references. And yet he still holds to a oneness Pentecostal view. Right. So that would be the difference, I think. Okay, gotcha. Um, sorry, I'm trying to type at the same time. Sorry. Thanks for you guys tuning in with us, man. Um, yeah. So let me ask you this now: How to handle 
theological disagreement with strangers or random encounters. And by this, I mean, like, say if you're on the street and all that, like you, you do street evangelism. Yeah. How do you deal with that theological or doctrinal disagreements right. with strangers or random encounters? Maybe you're walking down the street one day and somebody stops you. Yeah. Says something. So I think the first thing you have to do, what I tell people to do is find out if the person is an honest skeptic or not. That's, that'll determine whether you continue conversation or not. Yeah. Is this person actually digging in for info? Like, is, are they interested in what you have to say? Or are they, you know, honestly, you know, seeking a, an answer or whatever? Yeah. But if they're seeking to argue, then cut it. Yeah. Say, look, man, I ain't got time. Right. There's a point where you, 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 and You'll again, a lot of this has to do with discernment. Right. You have to have that You'll, discernment and wisdom and even experience. Yeah. You'll waste a lot of time, bro. I wasted so much time with people that, yeah, hours and, yeah, nothing. So, I, honest skepticism is what you want. Sometimes you got to allow a person to, to stay where they're at. And, like, God is, God is almighty. God is sovereign. Yeah. So those that are his, he's going to find a way to, to, to pull them in. Yeah. Whether it's through you or somebody else. And sometimes we always look at it like it has to be us. Yeah. Nah, sometimes they, sometimes they got to reject us in order for them to accept the truth later. Yeah. This is just, this is just the way it is. Um, let me ask you this. Have you ever had to separate until certain conditions were met? Like until this person says or agrees to this one thing, we're going to separate. Um, good question. Um, I can't say yes. Yes. I think, but the, here's the tricky thing is that it's, it's, it hasn't been communicated. Right. It's understood yeah. because of what happened, right? Things happen, but there's a separation that's understood. Ha you know, there's an understanding that there's separation because of this. But there hasn't been conditions placed, you know, okay. like yeah. for y'all to be for us to, to reconcile, to get together. This is what has to happen. All right. Um, nah, that hasn't. So I, it's almost a yes and no there. It's happened, but it. Yeah. Now that I think about it, it's like, wow, you know, there's a lot of things that weren't said. <laughs> yeah. You know. Again, this episode yeah. is challenging us. And, yeah. and right before we get into the comment section, I got one more question for you. All right. All right. <laughs> Has someone ever separated from you because of doctrinal disagreements? Absolutely. So get into that. Yes. A lot of people. <laughs> when I became reformed, it was over. You know. <laughs> uh, Done with them. <laughs> it, you know, and honestly, I laugh now, bro, but. It hurt. It hurt, bro. Mm. It 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 dug into me for years. You know, the people that I loved and disciple were distant and cold, mm. almost. You know, and then uh, at times I felt like they were fake because they were like smiling with me and and you know when they saw me and then when they they were around other people they acted like you know mm. they didn't know me. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they stopped liking my stuff on Facebook. They cut nice. me off on Facebook, you know, and all that. Like, that was hurtful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. For sure, man. Yeah, man. So let's get back to this comment section. I, 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 do, I did like those um, those answers you gave to the speed round questions today. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. Um, let's see. Tom Wolf said we should use every opportunity, including holidays and current events, to evangelize. If the general public is thinking even peripherally about God, grab that opening. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He, he's a, he, so I want to add this because I think this is important <laughs> for those of you who think theologically. So I think the way you view how God saves greatly affects an issue like this. Okay. Because... God's sovereignty? God's sovereignty and also the whole synergism, monergism, you know, those those are super important because they drive the way you evangelize and share and even approach people, you know what I'm saying? So I think... Um, His salvific providence. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I think that um, 
those so as a someone who's monergistic in in my view i'm left to utterly depend on god to convince or save this person a synergist i think i would argue uh is dependent on the person to be convinced yeah. and accept that affects the way you interact with people that's why theology matters at that point you know um because it greatly affects the way you come across people um and so uh, uh i would say an unbiblical view of 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 someone's salvation and how they come to it uh that can drive unbiblical practices gotcha you know um so that's that i just wanted to say that because that is a an important point to make when you interact with family members who have easter eggs <laughs> you know what i'm saying now we're gonna come across <laughs> this topic a couple times in a year right with holidays and all that right um right so yeah it's good that we get we talk about this now right it kind of sets it up for later too yeah and it opens up the door for more conversation because i'm sure everyone right now that's listening is going to think on this mm. and we're going to come back to it and think on it some more mm. and talk on it some more 